Today is Pledge Sunday, and uh, I'm so glad that we can talk about Pledge Sunday, and we're doing it from being ahead of budget. That's, that's always good, and so that uh, the preacher doesn't have to say, you got to start digging in deeper and all that kind of stuff, you know, that we can just say, God is really, really blessing us as a church. I, I, I don't know if you're aware of it, but the first tither in the Bible, now a tither means you give a tenth of what God's blessed you with. Now, the first tither in the Bible was a guy by the name of Abraham, and he gave a tenth of everything. That's what it says in Genesis chapter 14. Now his grandson Jacob is the first pledger in the Bible. Probably didn't know that. In Genesis 28, uh, you'll probably remember from Sunday school the story about when uh, uh, he was at Luz and he laid his head down on a pillow that was a rock and he had this dream and at the top of it was God and angels were going up and down the staircase and uh, he realized that God was in this place and he was fleeing from from his brother Esau, who he had just stolen his birthright, and he's been a pretty downright scoundrel kind of guy. But, but God was establishing a covenant and saying, I'm going to make you great like your father Abraham. And when he woke up, he changed the name of the place from Luz to Bethel, which means house of God. He says, because surely God is in this place. And so when he did that, he said, Lord, if you're going to bless me as you said, when I come back, I will pay you a tithe of everything. <laughs> that was a pledge. Now, unfortunately, I didn't find anywhere in the rest of the Old Testament told me whether he made good on that pledge. <laughs> but he made the pledge. I, I want to tell you, I started tithing when I was 11 years old. I got a paper out. A paper out. I made $10 a week. And so every week... Because I, I, I learned from my parents every week. They put an offering in an offering plate. So I, I would take the one that was in the, the pew and I'd put my, my dollar, one-tenth, in that envelope every week. At, so at the end of the year, you know what they did? They promoted me. They gave me a box of envelopes. <laughs> <laughs> I got the box. And so now I had my own number at the church. And, and I put my, my dollar in there. And I'm going to tell you something. God blessed my life. My brother Jerry, who was here just a couple weeks ago, and he's been here for the summer. They're back to Florida. You know, they're Florida residents. Um, he, he's a little older than I am, like nine years, almost ten. And uh, God was blessing me so much in my paper. I had lots of money. I, God just blessed me. I don't know. See, I, I'm of the opinion you can't outgive God. You just can't. So I, I, gave to, I was given to God. And, and my brother, who had just graduated from college, landed a job teaching at Henry Ford High School in Detroit, uh, wanted to buy a car, but he didn't have down payment money. So where did he go? <laughs> to his little brother that was the banker in the family. And, and he borrowed the money for a down payment on a brand new car from me. And of course, he did pay me back. B but I have observed, and, and all my life, since 11 years old, I've always, that's just the way it is. God gets the first tenth. That's it. God is blessed at times when I've actually been able to do more. And um, I, I found that this is true. I've never lacked because, because of his, God's blessing upon me. It, I say all of this because it is Pledge Sunday where we're going to make a commitment to the Lord uh, that anticipating his great blessing, this is what I want to do. Uh, I want to give this much. I want to give this much, Lord, and anticipate of your great blessing. In fact, Lord, I'm going to stretch myself because I really want you to bless me more. <laughs> And I'm going, to give, I'm going to give this to you. And, and it leads me right into what I want to talk about today because it just so happens to coincide with our study of the book of James. Our topic today is when money is all that matters. When money is all that matters. There are two extremes in our world today. There's an extreme that says, God wants me rich. And you can find this, you turn on your TV, you'll find these uh, televangelists that tell you that, uh, what I call the prosperity gospel, I didn't coin that, other people have coined that before me. But the prosperity gospel is basically this, God wants you healthy, wealthy, and demon free. And if, if you're not healthy, wealthy, and demon free, shame on you, you don't have enough faith, and, and I don't believe that is true at all. That's the prosperity gospel. The other extreme is this. God wants me poor. God wants me poor. 
I, we call this the vow of poverty gospel. I should be given everything that I have to the poor. Oh, and I should, I should feel so ashamed if I have anything and I've accumulated any wealth. And I don't believe either true, two of those are true. Abraham, who was the first tither in the Bible, was a wealthy man. He had at least 318 male servants in his household. I have none. So, I mean, besides all the wealth that he had, and God had promised him a great land real estate, Abraham was a very wealthy man, and he is called the friend of God. The friend of God. Now, there's another rich man in the Bible. His name is Dives. Well, um, at least that's the, the Latin term for the word rich. We really don't know his name. It's just they call him Dives because uh, the Latin word for rich, he was the rich man. And Jesus told a story about this rich man. Uh, he said to uh, uh, the Pharisees, he said, there, there, there was a certain rich man. Uh, and he said, uh, this rich man, uh, he's up at the table there. He fared sumptuously. He was in a robe of purple, very expensive. He had all the comforts of life. He was very rich. And so his name here, Debes, rich man. Now, at his gate, Jesus said, there was a man by the name of Lazarus. Common name, almost like the name John today. But there's this guy, Lazarus, who, who laid at his gates full of sores, begging from the rich man's table, just, just craving to have a crumb from, from his table. And it says, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So he's malnourished and he's... He, Jesus, in few words, paints the picture, two extremes. I want to suggest to you that the rich man was actually poor and the poor man was actually rich. Because as Jesus goes on, he says, and it came to pass that the poor man, Lazarus, died. And he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom or Abraham's side. He was carried to heaven. So he's carried to heaven, and so this, this poor man is really now really rich. <laughs> he's in heaven. And the text goes on, as Jesus says, and the rich man also died. And in hell, so what I'm su suggesting here is, and in hell, he lifted up his eyes being in torment. You see, even though he was rich, I'm suggesting he was really poor. He's really poor. The poor man was rich, and the rich man was poor. And, and the rich man, finding himself in hell, looking afar off, he sees Lazarus in Abraham's bosom uh, in paradise, and he says, Father Abraham, ask Lazarus to take and dip his finger in some water and just touch the tip of my tongue to quench the anguish of my pain. And Abraham says, well, you know that uh, there's a great gulf fixed between the two of us. We can't pass over to you, and you can't pass over to here. He, he said, then, then Father Abraham, send Lazarus back to my brother's I have five brothers. Go send them back to my brothers so that he can warn them of this place. He said, no, they have, uh, they have the law and the prophets. They have the word of God. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone went back to them from the dead, they would believe. And he said, they would not even be persuaded the one rose from the dead. Very prophetic about uh, Jesus Christ rising from the dead and still people are not persuaded of who he is. The whole point of this story is not that the rich man, his wealth indicate anything about his spiritual standing before God, nor the poor man. It has nothing to do with our wealth, our standing before God. The truth is, God doesn't want me rich, God doesn't want me poor. What God wants me to do is honor him with his wealth. 
You know, as I said, his wealth, it's his wealth. I know that from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, the Apostle Paul says this, what do you have that you did not receive? No, you're good. that'll stump you. You, you. you can't find anything. Well, I got a job. Well, somebody employed you. <laughs> I got a car. Well, somebody manufactured it, and you received it from them. Um, just go down the whole line. You can back this thing all the way up. What, what, everything you have, you've received from what, your life. Oh, I received it from my mother and father. Well, where'd they get it from? There, you go all the way back to Adam. Where did he get it? God gave it. You see, everything goes back to God. So that when the psalmist says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, he's saying, everything in the earth belongs to God. There's nothing that I have that I did not receive. Not a thing. He said a little bit before that in 1 in first, er, first Corinthians, he says this, moreover, it is required in stewards. That's what I am. I'm a steward of what God has. There's not anything that belongs to me. It all belongs to the Lord, and I'm just a steward of it. He says, it is required in stewards that they be found faithful. They be found faithful. All this is a long introduction to lead me to what I want to talk about today. It's really about how you use your wealth that matters. It's how you use it. He starts out in James chapter 5 with a warning. He says, warning about abusing wealth. He says, now listen, you rich people. Nine times he's already said, brothers, Brothers, he keeps talk, talking to his reader as brothers, brothers, brothers. Now he drops the brothers and he says, now listen, you rich people. And I'm not sure if he's talking about rich people in the church or if he's talking about rich people outside the church because he's dropped the word brothers, but he's saying, I'm changing my audience here. It's to you who are rich. Now, I know most of us here don't think we're rich. I'm going to tell you something. You are extremely rich. You are wealthy beyond compare. I've, I've been in third world countries. I've been in Mexico. I've been in, in the Philippines. I've been, I've been in places where, where I've seen poverty. Poverty. We are wealthy. He said, now, now, now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. First point, warning, money corrupts. Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. So I got uh, my wealth here is symbolized by a $20 bill. It's rotted. It's rotten. I'm going to jump back to the Old Testament. There's a little book called Haggai. It's named after the prophet Haggai. And Haggai is a, a preacher, and he's preaching to an audience that has been neglecting the work of the Lord. And the first thing he says here in verse 5, he says, consider your ways, and another translation puts it, give careful thought to your ways. He says in another place, look what's happening to you. These are all different translations of the same expression. And then there's my translation. <laughs> The Hebrew literally says, set your heart upon your way. What are all these expressions? Why, why did it, this is what it's saying. Examine yourself. Look at your life. See what God is doing in your life. And then he says, this is what Haggai says to his audience. He says, listen, you have planted much. He said, you work your tail off, but you harvest little. You're working like crazy, but there's nothing really to show for it. He goes on, he says, listen, you drink, quench your thirst, but you never have your fill. It seems like, man, I'm still thirsty. I just drank eight glasses of water, and I, I'm still thirsty. What's going on here? He, says, he goes on, he says, you eat, but you never have enough. And that whopper has turned out to be a little tiny slider. <laughs> You know what he's saying here? You're just not satisfied. Everything you're doing in this world, you come up short. There's got to be more. I'm discontent. I don't have enough. The next one he says here is, you put on clothes, but you're not warm. It, it seems like when I, when I try to make, uh, take a measure against my adversity, it just gets all the more adverse. 
It's just not going my way. He says, you earn wages. Now we're talking. I work my tail off. I get a paycheck only to put them in a purse with holes in it. My pocket's got a hole in it. The money that, here, I got this money, but you know, my taxes have gone up. My health insurance has gone up. I, I go down the whole list. I got less than when I started. I, I put my, I, I'm putting money in with a, a pocket full of holes. There's something draining it all off. That's what he's saying here in James. Your wealth has rotted. The moths have eaten your clothes. He goes on, he says, your gold and your silver are corrupted, or corroded. Now, now, somebody said, ah, here's a, here's a mistake in the Bible. Silver and gold can't corrode. This is a hyperbole. He knows that. He knows it only tarnishes. But what he's saying is, this is the impossible is happening to you. You should be ahead in life, but what's happening? You're behind. It's, it's corroded. And the corrosion will testify against you. He says, your gold and your silver, they will eat your flesh like a fire. It's like putting a, a Galaxy 7 in your pocket. <laughs> and it bursts into flames and you get burned. He's saying, your, your money's like that. He, he's saying, your gold, your silver, your money, it will eat your flesh like fire. The question is, why? And the answer is right here. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. It's exactly what they were doing in Haggai's day. They were keeping their money and hoarding it for themselves, and they were not giving it to the Lord as he had commanded. In fact, that's what he said. Consider your ways. Is it time for you yourselves to be living in paneled houses? These paneled houses were rather lavish, expensive, inlaid wood inside their homes. He's saying, listen, you live in luxury while my house remains a ruin. You put yourself before me. You've given me the leftovers while you take the very best. He said, listen, you expect much. But see, it turned out to be little. He says, what you brought home, I blew away. And you said, why? Oh, I just lost my screen. Did you lose it too? All right. He says, why? I'm going to have to pull up my Bible. He said, the rest of that text says, why? Oh, we got it back. Uh, why declares the Lord? He says, because each of you is busy with his own home while my house remains in ruin. What's he saying? You put yourself before me with your wealth. Whose is it? It's really mine. What are you doing? You're hoarding it to yourself? You're not honoring me with what you have? and I'm blowing against everything you've got. You see, money talks. Not the way we think. We think, oh, if I got money talks, I can influence people. And he says, no, no, money talks. The wages you failed to pay to the workmen who have mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord. You know what they've done? Uh, they've hired people, but then they didn't pay them, so they're really in debt to them. I want to suggest to you that Christians should avoid debt. Not all debt. But reasonable debt that you, you, you should be able to pay, you should be, don't put yourself in unnecessary debt. Some debt is good. I borrow from the bank so I could buy a home. I try to pay that off as fast as I can so that I can then begin equity in that home. I, I mean, I did this. And so then when I sold my house, I took the equity out of it and I put it on the next house and, and I turned that again, flipped that, made more. Some debt is good. But when you drive up your credit card debt or if we as a nation to $20 trillion debt, that is not good. Money talks against you. You're undisciplined in your life. You're not able to delay gratification and hold off on having things. you got to have it now. You put it yourself in debt, and then you say, oh, I can't afford to give to the Lord. That's not good debt. That's bad debt. Very bad debt. That cries out against you, 
And he says, and you have lived on earth in luxury. Oh yeah, I got everything I want, man. I got the latest phone, I got the, new, the nicest car, uh, hey, hey, whatever it is. I got now the gigantic 80 inch, 180 inch, 200 inch uh, uh, TV because they just get bigger and bigger. But man, I got the latest. I, I have lived and I've self-indulged myself. He says, you have fattened yourself for the slaughter. You've set yourself up for failure. You've set yourself up for failure. See, money kills. Isn't it amazing what people will do for money? You have condemned people. You've murdered them. Innocent men who are not even opposing you. Money kills. So he says, be patient. Be patient. Be patient then, he says, brothers. No longer talking to the, um, the rich people. He says, now, be patient, brothers. He switches. He's telling us, heads up. Those of you who are not rich in that category he was just talking about, he said, brothers, you're the ones that are usually on the other end of it. You're the ones that they're killing. You're the ones that they're condemning. You're the ones that are oppressing and holding back your, what, what's due you. He says, be patient, brothers.